Hello everyone, uh, my name is Robin Carhart Harris. I'm a postdoc at Imperial College London. Uh, I've been at Imperial for about six years uh, researching psychedelic drugs, mainly with a focus on how they work in a brain, in the brain rather, with, um, with a view to uh, trying to get a handle on this and to d develop a platform on which we then might explore how these drugs could be useful for example, in a, in a therapeutic context. So first of all, I want to be sure that you can see the screen okay. We've got two options where you can see me better and the screen not so well, or the screen well and me not so well. I prefer uh, the latter, actually, but, uh, but what about you guys? Can you see that screen okay? Most of the text is quite large, so um, it should be okay. Okay, so first of all, what are psychedelic drugs? Well, one way to, to tackle that is to try and define them biologically. So you can see here three different psychedelic drugs. We've got dimethyltryptamine, which is a compound found in a Amazonian brew called ayahuasca. Uh, we have LSD, which is a, a semi-synthetic compound derived from um, a fungus that grows on, on rye. Uh, we also have psilocin in the bottom uh, left there, which is the active metabolite of psilocybin, which is found in magic mushrooms. So most of my research has been focused on psilocybin and also LSD. Today I'm going to talk and focus mostly on our, our quite recent LSD research, but also provide a context uh, with reference to our psilocybin research as well. Now what's striking when you look uh, at these compounds, particularly dimethyltryptamine and psilocin, is how similar they are in structure to an um, endogenous neurotransmitter or neuromodulator, a chemical that, that uh, exists naturally in our brains um, and uh, is responsible for some very important functions like sleep, uh, um, mood, emotion, and also cognition or thinking. So it's quite striking, I think. It's quite remarkable that compounds that are so just subtly different from this very important neuromodulator um, that's in all of our brains can uh, confer such um, and have such a dramatic effect, a profound effect on our conscious experience. So I think, you know, immediately I think that's interesting and one of the reasons why these drugs are particularly interesting to study scientifically. So what do we know about uh, the basics of how psychedelic drugs work in the brain? Well, in the mid-1980s, there was a um, very important discovery that the stickiness or the, uh, rather the affinity of a psychedelic drug for a particular serotonin receptor. So these are proteins that, that are on, on neurons in the brain, on brain cells, and when they're stimulated, um, they alter the behavior of the host cell. Um, and there are some 14 different types of these serotonin receptors. They all do quite different things, sometimes you know, uh, sort of opposing things, very different things to each other. So um, th these are the kind of the, the switches that, that, that alter the, 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 um, the mode of functioning of our brains and our minds. And the serotonin 2A receptor, this particular subtype, the serotonin 2A receptor, seems to be especially important for how psychedelic drugs work in the brain. So in the mid-1980s, it was discovered that the affinity or the stickiness of psychedelic drugs for this serotonin 2A receptor correlates uh, positively and very strongly with their potency. And to help illustrate that, LSD has a particularly high affinity. It's especially sticky for this serotonin 2A receptor, and it's remarkably potent. It's one of the most potent psychoactive drugs that there is. It's psychoactive in doses as low as 20 micrograms, which is barely visible. It's just a speck. Um, now, um, we also know more recently that if you block the serotonin 2A receptor with what we call an antagonist or a, a drug that, that blocks the, the receptor, then um, if you do that before giving a psychedelic drug, then you'll attenuate the, the characteristic psychological effects of, of the psychedelic. So it's further evidence the kind of confirmatory evidence that this serotonin 2A receptor is especially important. Now, what I've shown in that, that image in figure two is a result that shows actually the positive mood effects of psilocybin, um, specifically 
are also significantly attenuated or, or normalized by um, blockade of that serotonin to a receptor. So it's not only responsible for the profound changes in consciousness that are characteristic of, of psychedelic drugs effects, it's also related to their positive mood effects, it seems. And that's something that we'll talk about more as this talk uh, uh, develops. So number three there, you know, people are going to want to know where are these receptors in the brain? Where are they expressed? This is a PET image uh, with a radioactive ligand, some, a chemical that, that sticks to actually the serotonin uh, 2A receptors here. And then we get a signal from where those, uh, those radioactively um, uh, tagged uh, molecules have bound. And then that tells us where those serotonin 2A receptors are. So it's a way of tagging where those receptors are. And when you do that, you find that the serotonin 2A receptor is very densely expressed in the cortex, in the outer parts of the brain, which is so you know, expanded in, in our species, in humans. Um, so if you think of the brain in a hierarchical sense, most of these serotonin 2A receptors are at the highest level of the hierarchy. Now that principle actually carry o carries over if you look more, um, more at a sort of fine-grained level of the cortex. So the cortex is organized into different layers, like a cake. You have the layer one at the top is the skull, and as you move down, you, you go from one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, the serotonin 2A receptors are especially heavily expressed on layer five pyramidal neurons, which are especially large and important neurons in the cortex. They project out of the cortex. And again, if we think in this hierarchical sense, they're at the, the higher end of the hierarchy, if not at the, the highest end of, of the hierarchy, in terms of complexity um, and importance of function. So here are some uh, uh, sort of points of importance that will be part of kind of the theme of this particular talk. Um, and I'm asking the question, what is brain serotonin for? One of the, one of the least well uh, answered and ad addressed questions in, in neuroscience. Um, it seems to do so much. It's involved in so many different things. Um, but no one really knows what selectively or what specifically serotonin does. But if we think about the different uh, receptors that serotonin has, then we can we can start to um, improve and, and, and develop and advance our understanding of what, what the serotonin system is for by thinking, for example, what is the serotonin 2A receptor for? If we know that stimulation of this receptor has profound effects on consciousness, then maybe it's related to something like uh, modulating the mode of, of our conscious experience. So we know that all psychedelic drugs work at the serotonin 2A receptor, and we also know that psychedelics cause these profound and actually enduring changes in consciousness and outlook, at least enduring in the sense of changes in outlook. Um, now, one hypothesis that I like to develop and, and sort of uh, propose to you is that the serotonin 2A receptor may be responsible for change. That sounds rather vague, um, but um, when I say that, I refer to change of our conscious experience acutely or uh, our you know, ongoing stream of consciousness, state of consciousness, if you want, but also change in terms of change in our outlook in the way that we look at the world. You might relate that to personality, for example, and certain you know, trait factors that are, that are enduring. So on that theme, what kind of change? Well, as I said, effects on consciousness, um, but also changes in, in outlook and personality. So uh, a couple of very interesting studies that were performed quite recently in the States found that um, after a single dose of psilocybin, so remember that's magic mushrooms, uh, some 67% of uh, these volunteers who'd never taken psychedelic, drug, psychedelic drugs before rated their experience under the drug to be among the top five most personally meaningful experiences of the whole of their lives. And so... To put that in a, in a context, some of the others that were up there in the top five are things like the birth of, of their first child or, or the, the death of an, an important family member. So major life events that have a significant impact on the way that we look at the world, really, and ourselves. So um, now what's interesting is that uh, people maintained over a year on that the experience was uh, still among the most meaningful of the whole of their lives, so an enduring effect. 
And similarly, when they were asked about their, any changes in their well-being, uh, a large majority, 79%, uh, reported an improvement in their sense of well-being. And this was enduring again. So, you know, over a year on, people were still saying that they, they felt an improvement in their sense of well-being. Incidentally, you might wonder whether there are any decreases in well-being, and there weren't in this particular study. Um, now, another um, sort of nuance of this study, which is particularly interesting, is they also issued the classic... Um, Big five, you may have heard of, uh, personality uh, inventory, which sort of measures different personality traits, five different traits. And what they found when they uh, issued this, um, this questionnaire at baseline and then over a year later, actually 14 months later, they found that a um, particular personality trait, openness, so one of the, the big five, was significantly increased. Now, this is quite remarkable because personality in, in adulthood is actually a, a very stable phenomenon. It shouldn't change because really when we reach adulthood, adulthood rather, we don't change that much. You know, we, we, we've got our personality and it's relatively fixed. But these people have changed and they change in the direction of an increase in, in trait openness. So I think that's interesting. So some other um, Studies that speak to this idea of change and actually change that can be useful in the context, for example, of psychiatric uh, disorders or conditions where uh, people are experiencing you know, some very uh, debilitating states, essentially, um, uh, that they'd rather not have, of course. Um, and so these studies have looked at that, and they're more and more coming out all the time. There's really quite a wave of of, of new uh, studies and new teams looking into this area, area, the therapeutic promise of psychedelic drugs. So I'll just go through them very briefly. The one at the top found uh, decreased, um, this is depression, depression, <laughs> should be decreased depression scores at uh, six months in patients who were suffering from anxiety related to dying. Um, so their depression scores were significantly decreased at six months. Another study looked at um, smoking addiction and actually found quite a remarkable result. Some 80% of um, previous smokers were abstinent from smoking six months after a single experience with psilocybin. I should say that the same was true in the depression study. People only had one experience with a drug, which is quite, again, it's quite different. It's quite unique in the context of, of normal psychiatric uh, interventions. Also, a study looked at alcohol dependence. A lot of work was done on this in the 1950s and 60s when LSD uh, first came on the scene, if you want. Um, and this study found uh, decreased drinking at uh, nine months in, in uh, previously alcohol-dependent individuals. Uh, also decreased anxiety, again, in a study with patients um, with anxiety related to dying, often with end-stage cancer. Uh, um, this was with LSD in this uh, particular case. All the others are, are actually um, psilocybin. Another study uh, did a, it was a population study, so it looked at a large survey of uh, close to 200,000 people in the state and looked at different um, parameters related to um, mental health, really. And uh, two particular parameters, two particular outcomes were found to be um, different in those who had reported some experience with psychedelic drugs, and they were psychological dis distress, which was actually lower in those who'd taken psychedelic drugs than those who hadn't, and also suicidality. So this is interesting. It's slightly counterintuitive. There's a kind of popular misconception, actually, that psychedelic drug use leads to mental health problems. So that wasn't evident in this particular survey, and I think that's interesting. Anything that's surprising uh, that may force a rethink is, is always interesting, I think. Um, and incidentally, other drugs of potential misuse were actually associated with an opposite effect, you know, mostly uh, increases in psychological distress and, and suicidality. So it's bucking the trend. There's something interesting and potentially useful about these drugs of supposed um, abuse, uh, potential abuse. Okay, so um, also it's worth for balance to say that there are anecdotes of some... Um, uh, Negative changes in, in mental health with psychedelic drugs. There are, you know, some cases of um, enduring psychoses that are actually very rare. If you look at the meta-analyses that have looked at this, it's in the region of, of I think, 0.1%. Uh, 
when the studies were reviewed in the 50s and 60s, and also mo modern studies aren't reporting this, and some quite a few hundred patients, I think, now have been treated with psychedelic drugs in modern studies. So it's something that is incredibly rare, even in vulnerable populations. And it's reduced if, if the drugs are administered in a particular way in a supportive setting with an appropriate level of, of preparation, care, and aftercare. So we have uh, a slide here which relates, again, to this idea of change. Here I'm citing some animal literature uh, that's found that... Um, uh, deficient stimulation of the serotonin 2A receptor. Whenever you see that 5-HD2A, that's referring to the serotonin 2A receptor, the one that's important for how psychedelic drugs work. So if, that, if there's uh, deficient stimulation of that receptor, then you see um, uh, perseveration, kind of repeating behaviors, which really is the opposite of flexibility or, or change, if you want. Um, and also um, some studies have found that LSD... Uh, can increase um, certain learning behaviors, associative learning, so low-level learning, and also some measures of uh, what's referred to as, um, uh, well, reversal learning, so the ability to switch behaviors, so flexibility, really. So this seems to be enhanced by LST in animals. Also some measures of uh, neuroplasticity and synaptic plasticity uh, have found to be um, increased with serotonin to a receptor stimulation, so different uh, psychedelic drugs have been found to increase uh, uh, markers of plasticity, particularly in the cortex, actually. So all these, these studies support this idea that the serotonin 2A receptor is related to some kind of change, some kind of increase in plasticity in the, in the brain and, of course, in the mind. So what have we been doing at Imperial? Well, um, since 2009, we've been uh, looking at 2010, the imaging study with psilocybin, We've been looking at, uh, at how psychedelic drugs work in the brain. So our first study was to um, use a particular uh, type of fMRI, um, different, a particular uh, fMRI approach to look at change in blood flow in the brain with psilocybin. This is a, a proxy or a, a measure of, of underlying brain activity, essentially. After that, we used the more classic fMRI um, uh, uh, approach using the bold signal to look at things like how different regions talk to each other how coherent their activity is, how different networks behave. You actually get more information, I would argue, with this bold approach. So that was the next study. After that, we used magnetoencephalography. You may have heard of EEG, um, electroencephalography. Um, so this is where we can measure um, uh, some, of the more f some of the faster uh, brain activity, some of the, the oscillations. You've probably heard of brain waves, you know. Uh, and how you can measure brain waves during sleep and how they change characteristically. So that's what MEG does as well. It measures these, these quite fast uh, uh, rhythms in the brain and, and changes in, in, for example, their frequency or changes in the, the rhythm and also changes in, the, um, in what we call their power, which is essentially the amplitude of the waves in a particular frequency band. So that's something that, that I will talk to, uh, talk to you about uh, shortly, we've also done an fMRI study with MDMA, which isn't really a classic psychedelic drug, but nevertheless, that's something that we did in, in 2012, and MDMA has its own interesting effects on the serotonin system. Um, so it can be quite useful as a comparator drug if one's focus and main interest, as mine, is, uh, is on classic psychedelic drugs like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and how they work in the brain to produce their particularly interesting psychological effects. So what I'll talk to you about now and what I'll present are some results from our recent LSD study. Uh, this incorporated both fMRI and MEG, so it was quite a comprehensive design and we could utilize the, the complementary um, approaches and, uh, of these two different modalities. With fMRI, you get very nice spatial resolution. You can see deep into the brain, into the, into the whole of the brain, something that you can't do with EEG and MEG, really. And also, we can, uh, with MEG, we can record the very fast activity that you can't record with fMRI. So these, these modalities, these approaches are complementary. We get something from each of them, you know, when information is missing from, from one or the other. 
So the volunteers were, were 20 healthy volunteers. They all had some experience with psychedelic drugs. It, it may have been just one experience. Uh, we had uh, 16 males and four females and a mean age of 31. They're scanned twice, two weeks apart. On one of those occasions, they're scanned with LSD, and on the other, they're scanned with placebo, and we balance the order. So half of the volunteers get LSD on the first day and half get placebo on the first day. So the dose of LSD is 75 micrograms. It's a moderate dose, I would say. Some people have quite, a, quite, a, you know, quite an experience with that dose, and some less so. Um, they also listen to music during the scanning, and that's another aspect of our research that I, I won't really uh, talk about today, although you probably heard the music if you were here early enough that was playing before I started speaking, and that's actually music that we potentially will play to our um, patients with depression that we're currently um, uh, um, looking into um, psilocybin as a potential treatment for treatment-resistant depression. So that's a, a sample of the music that we play in the, in the actual sessions. So this study was quite unique for us because um, in order to fund it, actually, we, we appealed to um, crowdfunding to support it. It's very difficult to, to get funding from mainstream funders for this kind of research. It's really relied on relied on private funding um, to, to, to make it happen. So um, again, in this context, um, we, we appealed to crowdfunding, and it was actually very successful. So uh, that was a, a good news story. But uh, to return to the science and the important stuff, um, in terms of the design, uh, the uh, infusion, the, the drug was administered intravenously. Um, that can shorten the onset of the effects and actually abridge the experience, which is useful in terms of management of, 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 the, uh, of the study. Um, so the drug's administered some 60 minutes before we start the scanning. That's getting close to the, the actual peak uh, effects of LSD. Peak effects are felt at about 90 minutes after you infuse the, the drug. Uh, it's actually infused over three minutes. It's, it's what we call a bolus. Um, and then they have a break after the fMRI scanning, and they're scanned with MEG. It's actually quite a demanding uh, uh, study for the participants. Um, uh, and then there's a break after the, the MEG, and they do um, some psychology tasks. So I'm going to focus today mostly on the fMRI, a little bit. I'll mention the MEG, uh, but the focus is really on the, the LSD research and the fMRI imaging. So before I talk about any of the details, it's worth getting a feel for uh, some of the kind of experiences that people report with uh, LSD and other psychedelic drugs. Here the first one says that everything became fragmented. Things were all in bits, and it was very hard to hold it all together in a coherent stream. Uh, so this speaks to this kind of disintegration experience that I'll talk about more as we go on. Another one particular experience, which is quite abstract, but nevertheless seems to be very important and may actually be related to kind of why psychedelic drugs are especially interesting and unusual in their effects. And it's that people sometimes describe this ego disintegration. So here a volunteer has said after his experience with psilocybin that uh, that was real ego death stuff. I only existed as a concept, as an idea. So that normal sense that we have that our personalities, our sense of self, our <coughs> ego is something absolute, something enduring something that's always there and is, is relatively solid, seems to disintegrate away under or dissolve away under psychedelic drugs. So, you know, as a phenomenon that should be uh, deserving of, of scientific study, however difficult it is to study, then psychedelics are clearly very powerful tools to study that, that phenomenon. Um, so another endorsement of why they're, they're, they're interesting and important to study scientifically. Also, this last one says that uh, the feeling of no boundaries. I did not know where I ended and my surroundings began. Somehow I was able to comprehend what oneness is. So this is very much related to this experience of ego dissolution or ego disintegration. And it's something that's sometimes referred to in psychiatry as ego boundaries, the sense that you have a self which is different to the rest of the world, that it's somehow apart from the rest of the world. And when the ego dissolves or disintegrates under psychedelic drugs, what comes with that often is a sense of, of what's often described as a sense of oneness um, that's been described in the context of 
studying spiritual or religious experiences as a sense of unity or unitive experience. Um, and it, it's this sense of being less distinct from the outside world, uh, closer to other people and closer to other things, anything that's external to the self. So before I report the results of the LSD study, it's worth giving you, um, to sort of give, give a context really about some important characteristics of, of the brain and normal brain uh, function and activity. And two important principles are um, integration in the brain and segregation. So integration speaks to how the kind of cogs work together, how different regions, for example, work coherently together, uh, leading to the emergence potentially of, of high level functions. Um, for example, different regions that contribute to processing uh, the visual um, uh, sensorium uh, or the, the, the auditory um, you know, senses, uh, sensorium. Um, and uh, how these, these regions work together as, as a network, a coherent network that subserves particular functions. And really that's, for the last, uh, I guess, uh, certainly decade, maybe um, a couple of decades, that's sort of the direction that, that neuroscience has been going in, and cognitive neuroscience. Not thinking in this kind of phrenology-like way that this region does this, but rather that these distributed regions work together coherently as a network or a system to subserve different functions. So that's integration. What about segregation? Well, this is the um, principle that there are different systems in the brain, different networks, if you like, that subserve different functions. And they have to because we do different things and have different uh, experiences and have different behaviors. So, for example, we have a visual system, a visual network, and we have a, a motor system or a, a motor network. And it's really important uh, uh, that these systems have some degree of segregation, that they do different things, that they parcelate off so that they can uh, do their, their different functions with a degree of speciality. Now, what's interesting is that both of these things um, actually develop as we develop, as we mature from being born into being adults. Um, so you see an increase in integration, so networks begin to tighten up, and you also see networks begin to parcelate off, to become more distinct from each other. So that's what you see normally during normal healthy maturation or development. Now, you'll be curious, I imagine, if you've never seen what, uh, what kind of signal the fMRI actually detects. So, so what we're seeing here is, is the bold signal from fMRI. You can see a green uh, time series here, and you can see an orange one. These are from do, two different regions in the brain. The green one is from the right motor cortex, and the orange one is from the left motor cortex. And what you can see when you look at these time series is that they're, they're coherent, they're synchronous, they go up and down in synchrony. And this suggests that they're working together. So it's that principle of integration. They're working together as the same, as the same system to subserve a common purpose or function. In this case, motor action or you know, movement. Uh, if you look at the uh, row below, you can see a, a kind of purple or dark red time series and the orange one again. The orange one is also from the left motor cortex as before, but this purple one is actually from the visual cortex. And what you can see when you look at these time series is that they're not synchronous, they're not correlated. They're what we call orthogonal, which simply means they're not correlated. And this suggests that these regions and the systems that they belong to are segregated. They do different things. And we know that uh, um, they subserve different functions, you know, motor action and visual processing, visual perception. So you can see, you know, in a more kind of immediate and direct way what we're talking about when we refer to integration and segregation in the brain. So here's a very, uh, lot of information on this slide, but these are really, I would say, the, the main results from our recent LSD study. And what you're seeing here are 12 different networks. We've got three visual networks at the start there, one, two, three, they're all visual networks. We've got an auditory network, number four, We've got a sensory motor network, five, We've got this default mode network, which is related to higher level uh, functions, um, introspective functions, imagination, sort of scene construction. Um, also, perhaps some species-specific functions, like our sense of self, uh, 
and our ability to, um, to mentalize or, or take another person's point of view, which is referred to as theory of mind. And these other, function, these other networks as well, which, which all have kind of uh, distinct, to some extent, uh, quite distinct uh, uh, functions from each other. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've identified these networks on actually independent data so as not to bias our own results when we look at the difference between LSD and placebo. So we get these networks. Then we ask the question, how do they change under the drug relative to placebo? And what we have here in these bar charts are three different measures. We've got blood flow in uh, red. We've got the integrity of the network, which is how, how kind of bound together the different bits of the network are. And we have something which is related to that, which is called signal variance, which is kind of related to the, the amplitude of, of the signal in these particular networks. And what I want to focus on is this integrity measure because it's more intuitively, um, it's, more, it's easier to intuit what it means functionally. And uh, when you look at um, these different networks, what you see is that there's quite a, a uh, first of all, a marked change in the integrity of the networks. And the effect is universal. All of the networks, more or less. I think the auditory network's the exception, which doesn't quite reach statistical significance, but all the other networks show a decrease in their intrinsic integrity. So they actually disintegrate, if you want, under LSD. So another thing that we looked at is how the different networks talk to each other, how related they are to each other. So this is a measure of segregation rather than integration, as you just saw. And what we have here are what we call correlation matrices. Uh, and the, the red refers to positive correlations, where networks have relatively coherent, relatively synchronous activity with each other. And the blue is where the activity is either orthogonal or actually antiphase uh, or negatively correlated. So as one activity in one system goes up, activity in the other system goes down. And there's a kind of yin-yang relationship, opposing relationship or competitive relationship between those networks, uh, the, ones, the ones that are in blue there. So here's placebo, here's LSD, and you only really see the difference when you plot the difference. Uh, red here are where network pairs so these are always pairs, you know, network two to network um, seven. Um, how they change under LSD, whether they become more communicative with each other and so therefore less segregated from each other, or the opposite, they become more segregated from each other. And what we see, the, the major direction of change is in the direction of networks becoming uh, less segregated from each other. So that normal segregation that you see that develops through development and maturity is actually reversed with psychedelic drugs. So you get a desegregation effect between different networks. Now, it's important to say that this hasn't been found in isolation. We found very similar things with psilocybin. We saw disintegration in brain networks, and we also saw desegregation. And actually, when we looked at MDMA and did the same analyses on MDMA, we didn't find the same thing, especially the segregation measure. So MDMA is something that is a drug that, that you know, does have quite potent um, psychoactive effects, but it doesn't fundamentally alter consciousness in the way that classic psychedelic drugs do. So for me, I think that's suggestive uh, that there's something particularly important about how you get this desegregation effect, how you get this kind of merging, this blending of different networks that subserve different functions only on the classic psych psychedelic drugs, at least as we've seen with psilocybin and LSD. And you don't get it with another potent psycho psychoactive drug that may quite potently uh, alter mood. It's a positive mood-enhancing drug. Um, but it doesn't have these, these effects on consciousness that the classic psychedelic drugs have. So these principles of a general desegregation that you see with psychedelics, classic psychedelics, and another important principle is that the particular networks that were becoming less segregated from each other were often um, low-level networks. So let's think in a hierarchical sense here. The low-level networks are ones that process sensory input coming in. So things like the visual network and the auditory network, the motor network, the, the um, somatosensory 
network, which is related to the motor network. So these, these systems you would regard as hierarchically lower level. They do more kind of um, uh, fundamental uh, functions, simpler functions in a way, even though, of course, they're not. Um, and then you have high-level networks that are more related to high-level uh, functions like um, thinking, uh, cognition, you know, um, and some high-level aspects of cognition like things like our sense of self, our ability to imagine what somebody else is thinking, or just our ability to imagine. Um, so this effect was particularly between those different, those, those, um, those different networks, ones that were low-level, like the sensory networks and the motor network, and those high-level networks, like the ones, like this default mode network, for example, which is related to very high-level, arguably species-specific functions, like having a sense of self. So that speaks to this principle of a decrease in the normal hierarchical organization that you see in the brain. The brain is organized in this, in this hierarchical fashion. And that seems to be another very important principle about how the brain is and also how it develops as we develop. So um, I think it's quite useful when uh, giving these kind of talks that you provide some metaphors. Uh, and there's always that caveat that they are just metaphors. Um, but nevertheless, I think they're quite useful for for um, the purpose of communicating, which can be quite difficult ideas and principles to, to people so that they can understand them um, and, and hopefully um, take them home with them and remember these, these kind of take-home messages. So um, these three principles of network disintegration, you could think of a, of a network, a system, as a city, for example. A city is a network, it's a system. And imagine if that city was to collapse, you know, and imagine perhaps what those, the implications of that kind of collapse would be for the functioning of the broader system, for example, like the country that hosts the city. So it's useful, I think, to think of sort of network disintegration in relation to a city collapsing, for example, uh, however provocative that idea is. Um, also, if we think of um, network desegregation, if you try and find a mechanical uh, context for desegregation, because segregation itself is something which is becoming quite common in, in, in the parlance of cognitive neuroscience when thinking about different networks, you don't find, if you do a Google search, you don't find any examples, mechanical examples of desegregation. You only actually find the political use of the term, which is mainly around racial desegregation. So again, you know, you can think of that as, as a kind of unifying change, uh, political change, which could help to kind of, uh, as a metaphor, to explain kind of this general desegregation that we're seeing between different networks in the brain, a kind of unifying uh, uh, change in the brain. Also, if you get a collapse of hierarchy, if you do a Google search with, uh, and enter hierarchy uh, and look for an antonym, an opposite of hierarchy, you find mayhem. But another thing that you find is, uh, is anarchy. So, you know, the, an anarchist, anarchist principle is about the, the kind of dissolution of hierarchy, the loss of hierarchy. So, you know, although these all have a political context, which I'm going to end with, actually, uh, some, some thoughts on that. I think it's interesting. These are just metaphors, but nevertheless, I think they're quite useful to help, help you to kind of grasp what's changing in the brain with psychedelic drugs. So uh, this is a result from our MEG research with psilocybin. I'll just tell you about it briefly. What it's showing is a kind of, I've, I've referred to it as a scrambling effect in the cortex. It's a desynchronization of the normal rhythmicity in the, in the cortex, in a particular rhythm, the alpha rhythm. And what we found was that the, the magnitude of the decrease in, in this rhythmicity, um, or the magnitude of the desynchronization in this particular frequency band, correlated positively with a particular aspect of the subjective experience with psilocybin. And that was an item that people rated after the experience, which read, I experienced a disintegration of myself or ego. So the more people had that, the greater was the uh, desynchronization in a particular frequency band, the alpha frequency band, uh, in, in, um, in a region of the brain which is related to a very high level network or system and it's the one that I've been referring to in the context of very high-level functions, like the sense of self, theory of mind. So the greater the, the kind of collapse, if you want, in the, of the rhythmicity in this particular region, in this network, 
the greater were people's experiences of ego dissolution or ego disintegration. It seems to be a nonlinear effect, but uh, nevertheless, it's a, a particularly strong correlation. When I say nonlinear, it's a kind of either or thing. People either get it or they don't at all. Um, and so, based on that, and seeing that both with the MEG and seeing it with the fMRI with psilocybin, that uh, that sort of motivated a particular hypothesis when looking at the LSD data that this network, this default mode network, which again is related to the, to the sense of self, these high-level uh, uh, functions, uh, that the, the magnitude of the disintegration in this particular network would correlate positively again with people's ratings of ego disintegration or ego dissolution. And we found that. It was a weaker correlation, but nevertheless, we had quite a strong prior, as we say, or prior hypothesis, prior belief that we were going to see this. We tested it, and it was supported. But what's been nice about the LSD data is we've been able to advance on that and nuance it slightly. So we've looked at uh, particular connections within the default mode network. There was, there's a number of reasons to look at a particular kind of subcortical aspect of the default mode network. This, this, the parahippocampus. And uh, when we ran an analysis which looks at how the rest of the brain talks to the parahippocampus, how synchronous its activity is with the, the parahippocampus, we actually saw a very marked decrease in synchrony or decrease in communication between the parahippocampus and a part of this default mode network, this posterior cingulate part, ventral posterior cingulate for those who know, retrosplenial cortex as well. So this kind of disconnection in this connection that's normally there uh, related very strongly with people's ratings of ego dissolution or ego disintegration. Now, I've put two lines on here because we also looked at um, another um, ratings on another questionnaire which looks at different dimensions of the altered state of consciousness produced by LSD and other, psych other psychedelic drugs. And this particular factor, this particular dimension, is referred to as altered meaning. And it contains items that I'll show you in a moment are kind of related to things taking on a special significance, seemingly special significance, when normally they, they don't. And we also found a, a strong positive relationship between the, the strength of the splitting or disconnection between this particular connection and people's ratings of altered meaning under LSD. Now, this is perhaps the most um, complicated slide, but nevertheless, I can break it down. And it's really talking about what the function of this system is that we're looking at now, the default mode network, and particularly this hippocampal, parahippocampal aspect of it. So when people have reviewed the, the function that's related to this system, they have put the focus really on, a, on our ability to um, construct things mentally. So that's very much related to our ability to imagine things. Um, and to give things also a kind of contextual anchorage. And I think there's something really important in that, that anchorage, that mooring of, of, of experience into some kind of context uh, that may be very important for what our sense of self is. Um, one of the, the ways, I mean, the self is this very sort of slippery construct, this abstract construct that is very difficult to study, but nevertheless, when it's been... Uh, when people have tried to deconstruct it, one aspect of it that they've, they've um, talked about is this sense of having a story, a personal story or a personal narrative. And this aspect of the self has been referred to as the narrative self. I think you can only really have a story and a narrative if you can have an anchorage in your past. You know, if you can remember what's happened in your past, then that's stuck. It's there. It's your experience. So when people have reviewed the function of this system, that's the kind of thing that they've talked about. Now, uh, a correlation I've shown here is quite a weak correlation, uh, but nevertheless it's significant really because of the, the number of data points, I think, but nevertheless it is a significant correlation. Uh, and it's between um, the frequency with which people, people's minds wander off task and start daydreaming about the past or the future. So the more people did that, the stronger was the, the link, the stronger was the association between the medial temporal regions, which contain the hippocampus and parahippocampus, and the other cortical aspects of the default mode network. I think this is probably a little bit complicated for you, but really the, the principle and the, the take-home message is that 
And the question is that, is ego dissolution linked to a loss of temporal mooring? That ability to what's referred to in psychology as mental time travel, that arguably species-specific function to look way into our past with quite a high degree of um, complexity and specificity and, 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 and um, yeah, um, that ability to, to think you know, far back into our past, think about our childhood and imagine our childhood, for example, or prospect, think about the future, potentially quite far into the future, and to plan. Um, so the more people actually do that, the tighter is the link in this particular system. And it's worth thinking that when the ego dissolves, perhaps that anchorage, perhaps that mooring to our story, to our past, to our narrative, is what breaks away. So do you need to have a sense of time to retain a sense of self. Okay, so that, that item, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about that item, Altered Meaning, because it seems to be particularly interesting, and it's interesting in the context of schizophrenia research, actually, because although it's a contentious issue, psychedelic drugs do mimic aspects of psychosis, um, and particularly um, an experience called... Um, aberrant salience, so the, the, the experience of things taking on a special importance or significance is something that's been linked to the phenomenology of psychosis as part of schizophrenia. And these items that make up that, uh, that dimension, that factor, uh, um, are as, as follows. So objects in my surroundings touch me more emotionally. Things in my surroundings had a new or alien meaning. And some important things acquired a special meaning. So it's interesting that you know, people rating these items especially highly on LSD, and we're seeing it's related to this disconnection. Uh, it's interesting to think about, uh, uh, about the context of schizophrenia. And a very famous um, uh, hypothesis of the neurobiology of schizophrenia, which came out in the mid-1980s by some very um, um, esteemed uh, 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 neuroscientists and psychologists, Carl Friston and, and, and Chris Frith, propose that uh, underlying schizophrenia is actually a schism, is a, is a mechanical split, uh, a disconnection. And I'm just sort of raising the idea, the possibility that actually the split is between the uh, hippocampus, the parahippocampus, and this posterior cingulate cortex region. So just a little bit of context, again, to help you kind of grasp some of these principles. One thing that you see with psychedelics in terms of the phenomenology, the change in, in, in experience is a kind of regression. So people can become quite um, sort of uh, immature in a way. Um, and uh, um, also, if we think about how the properties of the brain networks change, they're changing in a direction of, um, in a kind of regressive direction. They're doing the opposite or the inverse of, uh, or the reverse of what you see normally when people mature. So it's this uh, proposition that... Um, what the brain's doing in the psychedelic state is to regress, to regress back, back to infancy. It's also worth considering the possibility that the brain's regressing in a kind of evolutionary uh, sense as well, moving from a kind of analytical, constrained way of thinking to a more perhaps loose, flexible, uh, perhaps magical style of thinking in the psychedelic state, something similar that you would see in infancy. And this is a quote from someone writing about the psychedelic experience, which I think is interesting and speaks to that. And he says that uh, we're shut off from our own world normally. Primitive man once experienced the rich and sparkling flood of the senses fully. Children experience it for a few months until normal training and conditioning close the doors on this world, and usually for good. Somehow psychedelic drugs open these ancient doors, and through them, modern man uh, may at last go and rediscover his divine birthright. Uh, so I think that, that talks quite nicely to that principle. Here's William Wordsworth talking about the quality of consciousness in infancy, and it's a particularly nice quote from a, one of his poems, uh, Intimations of Immortality, and he says that not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. I think there's something particularly beautiful about that line. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. So it's talking about that kind of a spiritual experience in infancy. 
And if you think about psychedelic drugs and the phenomenology, something that often comes up and is related to this experience of ego dissolution and this experience of dissolved ego boundaries is a, a kind of people reporting a, a kind of spiritual quality or mystical quality to their experience. So all these things are kind of converging evidences. Now, some of this is quite dense, and I realize I'm probably a little bit over time. I know we started five, ten minutes late. Um, so so I'll, I'll cut through some of this dense stuff, but there are questions at the end which, um, which you might want to ask me about it. <laughs> Um, but um, I want to end by telling you that we're researching depression now. A lot of what we've been doing is looking at the fundamentals. I think you have to address that big mystery, you know, something which is really important to address and we know so little about is how the heck do these drugs work in the brain? How do they ch change brain activity? And only in knowing that can we then start thinking how could they be used? You know, it provides a it can provide potentially a strong rationale for the application of the drugs if we see, for example, that changes in brain activity are suggestive of what, what of, are suggestive of, for example, uh, antidepressant properties or other therapeutic properties. So just to say that we're researching depression now, a major, major um, public health problem um, estimated to become the leading contributor to the global burden of disease by uh, 2030. So really a major problem that actually receives disproportionate, uh, disproportionately low funding in relation to other major public health problems. And we're doing that. Um, and there's some modern studies looking at that also indirectly when looking at anxiety related to dying. Most recently looking at it directly with ayahuasca, that Amazonian brew that contains DMT. Now I wanted to end with this challenging thought that what underlies political perspective has to be... Uh, has to be brain function. I, that's a very challenging idea, I think, but nevertheless, I think it has to be true. Um, and so, perhaps being slightly mischievous, but also wanting to stimulate thought, in using these metaphors that have, a political, um, have political connotations, it's worth thinking, and it's led me to, to ask, you know, in my own mind, that uh, can psychedelics, via their action on the brain, and these enduring changes in outlook that have been found uh, have the potential actually to change political perspective. And when you think about that, you might think maybe that's why they were banned. You know, if there's not a, a strong uh, rationale to, to support their harm over their potential therapeutic benefit, then it's just worth thinking. Maybe there was something in that. This is a chap uh, who uh, says some quite crazy things, but nevertheless, he also comes out with some gems every now and again. Uh, he's he's uh, passed away now, but um, Terence McKenna, and he said something interesting here. He said that psychedelics are illegal not because of a loving government, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally lay down models of behavior and information processing. Now, Another bit of context, which I think would take me a bit too long to go into, but this is uh, Bobby Kennedy raising the question in the 1960s when LSD was banned, why it was being banned uh, um, uh, when, um, when it seems to be beneficial for some people. And he says, I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society. Incidentally, he probably would have gone on to be uh, president, Bobby Kennedy, but he was, uh, he was assassinated. And with that... I'd just like to uh, thank David Nutt, who's been my mentor for the last 10 years and has allowed me to research this topic about which I'm passionate about, and he's kind of guided me for the last 10 years. Amanda Fielding of the Beckley Foundation, who's provided such crucial support from the beginning for this research. We wouldn't have been able to do it without her. Those who supported the crowdfunding campaign, a large number of people who've been incredibly helpful along the way, and of course, it wouldn't have happened as well without them. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.